Welcome to the webinar series. Today's webinar is Framing Long-Term Care, Frailty and Recognizing Appropriate Medications in Geriatrics and Long-Term Care. Before I introduce our speakers today, I'll do a quick overview of the CFN news and how we go through our webinar process. Uh, today, Amanda Lorberg's our manager of research in KT will uh, facilitate the Q&A session. So please submit your questions online during the presentation. The more we have, the better the presentation will be. We'll try to get to as many questions as uh, time permits before the webinar ends. But if, you do not, if we do not answer all of your questions by the end of the webinar, uh, our four presenters have offered to answer your questions if you send them an email. The email will be on the last slide at the end of the presentation, and we'll leave it there so you can um, write that down. Um, just, we are always looking for your feedback on how to improve our webinar series. So we'd really appreciate if you could complete the short survey, and I emphasize short, um, that will pop up on your screen after the webinar. The webinar slides and the video are usually available with between 24 to 48 hours and you can see the URL on this slide if you want to go to, to there after and re-listen or review the slides again. We have two webinars um, scheduled uh, and hope you can join us. We have one on Wednesday, November 21st and that's the National Comparison of Intensity of End-of-Life Care in Canada and that's with Robert Fowler and Andrea Hill from Sunnybrook. And also on Wednesday, December 5th, we hope you'll join us and please register at any time. You can go onto our website now if you, if you like. Um, it is with John Hurdies and George Heckman and they're doing care of acutely ill older persons living with frailty. Right now we have our 2019 uh, training competition. It'll be the 2019 uh, Summer Student Awards. Um, which will begin May, um, but the apply forms or the, the intent to apply forms do next Tuesday, and as well the interdisciplinary fellowship program. Um, and please keep looking at the um, website for the interdisciplinary fellowship program because we are planning on adding additional partners that you could apply for if you don't have a partner. Um, so you'll see there on our website where that competition is and just so that everyone knows our website is under design change right now um, so if you can't find it please send us an email um, but I think it is a little bit easier to uh, maneuver but it's still not quite ready anyhow that's the only competition we have right now so I will introduce the four presenters today uh, first, we have Dr. Andrew Morris. He's a professor um, in the Department of Medicine, Division of Infection Diseases at the University of Toronto, and a consultant in infection diseases in general internal medicine at Sinai Health Systems and the University Health Network. We also have Dr. Susan Bronsgale. She's a senior scientist and program lead at ICES. And then we have Dr. Leanne Jeffs. She's the Research and Innovation uh, Lead Scholar in Residence and Senior Clinician Scientist with Lunenfield Taubaum Research Institute of Sinai Health System. Sorry, I may have not pronounced that well. And we also have Dr. Colleen Maxwell. She is a professor and a university research chair of the School of Pharmacy and Public Health and Health Systems at the University of Waterloo. So please go ahead with your presentation. And I think, Susan, you're going to start today's presentation. So Matt will just um, put the slides over to you. OK, I can see your slides now. That's, that's great. And I actually, um, I think that Dr. Maxwell and I are going to tag team on the first portion of our presentation. So welcome, everybody. And again, just to uh, echo what was said previously, please send in questions and comments. And we're also very happy to continue conversations offline. So what we're going to be talking to you about today is um, some of our work that was funded by one of the very original competitions uh, from CFN back when it was called TBN, um, looking at 
the role of frailty and medication use um, in long-term care and assisted living environments. And uh, there were five of us who were leading this work. Dr. Heim Bell is the only one who wasn't able to join us today, uh, but luckily for you, you'll hear from all of the rest of us in the, the course of the next hour. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge our terrific research team uh, before we get started, particularly the staff that have been working with us at ICES, Michael Campitelli, Christina Jiang, uh, Vasily Janikaeus, June Wan, and Laura McClagan have all been instrumental in helping us get the um, variety of projects completed that we have, at least on the ICES side of things. And then we're also um, the series of co-investigators who are listed here who were named on the original application. Uh, but part of what has been terrific about uh, proceeding with this program of research has been the opportunity to bring in others to shed insights and collaborate as our um, grant has moved forward. Next slide, please. So broadly speaking, what we did over the course of our funding was to bring together a diverse group of investigators to look at the relationship between frailty and medication appropriateness in the long-term care and assisted to living environments. And you'll see from what we present today that we employed multiple methods. So uh, Dr. Maxwell and I led the work out of ICES that we've been calling the quantitative portion of things. Um, but Drs. Jeff and Morris will be talking a little bit more about some of the mixed methods we've used. We've had um, four highly qualified personnel to use CFN terminology come through our program. Um, and have probably had upwards of 50 different investigators and collaborators and knowledge users as we've carried out our study deliverables. Next slide, please. So what uh, Dr. Maxwell and I are going to do for you uh, in the first 10 minutes of the presentation is talk specifically about the portion of our research program that we call the quantitative portion. And this is really looking at the role of potentially inappropriate medications uh, in the long-term care environment, and in particular, um, thinking about the relevance to frail older adults. Uh, we conducted this work out of ICES, which is an independent, not-for-profit research institute that uses population-based health and social data to produce knowledge about a broad range of uh, healthcare issues. And in particular, we were interested in looking and comparing and contrasting uh, four different classes of, of medications. So we looked at antibiotics, uh, benz well, four-ish, benzodiazepines, antimicrobials, statins, and cholinesterase inhibitors, um, and again, conducted this work out of ICS. Uh, Andrew and Leanne will talk to you a little bit further about the grade out portion. Don't expect you to be able to process this, but we've had uh, upwards of 10 deliverables that have resulted from this uh, grant in the form of peer review publications, uh, as well as a report that we prepared for the Canadian Institute for Health Information. And uh, what Dr. Maxwell and I are going to do is a very high level uh, talk to you about three of these studies, just to do a sampling of uh, what the issues and thoughts were related to frailty as we proceeded with our research and um, some of the other factors associated. So very broadly across that whole spectrum of 10 studies that we just showed you, um, we were able to demonstrate that frailty exists as a spectrum in older adults and, and even in the long-term care environment, um, and that it can be assessed using the clinical items that are readily available in population-based data. So the one nice thing about doing research in the ICES environment is we're looking at entire populations, or at least entire populations packed with the health system. Uh, and in particular, the items that we were interested in came from a resident assessment instrument, which is used in the long-term care environment, in Ontario nursing homes, and um, as well as in resident uh, um, assisted living facilities in Alberta, um, which is part of the interi suite of tools. Um, and so broadly speaking, we found that frailty was associated with potentially inappropriate medication use and modified drug-related outcomes in these populations, um, but that driver and resident and facility and system level factors also played a role over and above frailty, and you'll see that in some of the examples we show. Um, the other important issue was, or important finding, was that the direction and magnitude of the associations that we found uh, would sometimes contradict what the clinical expectations might be. 
So uh, some of our studies, frail individuals often receive more rather than fewer potentially inappropriate medication. Uh, so what we're going to do now is um, tag team a little bit. Dr. Maxwell is going to talk to you about the first study that we did in Alberta assisted living facilities. Then I'll be back again, and then Dr. Maxwell will close things out. Thank so you. Take it away, Colleen. Thank you, Susan. So this uh, first slide, we're showing the antipsychotic use and hospitalization among older assisted living residents. Uh, we aim to look at the association between antipsychotic use and hospitalization, and whether it was modified by frailty status. So this is one of the uh, first studies that we did. And importantly, it looks at assisted living, which is uh, a care setting that has been relatively unexplored and an emerging um, more popular care setting as we look at the shift from um, institutionalized to community-based options. In this particular study, we found that frailty status, but not baseline antipsychotic use, was significantly associated with an increased risk for hospitalization over a one-year follow-up. However, when we stratified by frailty status, we found uh, interesting associations between antipsychotic use and hospitalization. Um, so we actually use two different measures of frailty. We use the frailty index that is derived from items on the resident assessment instrument, this particular instrument for assisted living, similar to the one we use in long-term care, home care in Ontario. And we also used the other um, approach to frailty, which is often, often called the uh, physical phenotype or, the, or sometimes the freed um, uh, approach, which is based on five items, largely physical items um, in performance tests. And interestingly, we found that uh, regardless of the frailty measure, we found similar associations when stratified by frailty status. So a lower risk of hospitalization for users of antipsychotics among those who were robust, but a higher risk of hospitalization um, among users of antipsychotic compared to non-users among those who are frail. And this is perhaps best illustrated in this particular figure. So we can see the increase in risk as we go across frailty status. So this was a first look at possible effect modification of a drug-related adverse effect. And we chose antipsychotics as a candidate medication because of the potential known risks uh, for vulnerable older adults uh, who are often dealing with uh, multiple drugs, multiple conditions. The next study um, is uh, a study on low-dose trazodone, benzodiazepines, and injuries, and I'll let Susan describe this. So in this study, we were very interested in looking at what's been happening in the nursing home environment as rates of um, benzodiazepines and uh, relatedly antipsychotic medication use over time. And so this particular study was a matched cohort study looking at the comparative effects of, of two drugs. So there's some suggestion that um, from the clinical literature and clinicians on our team that low-dose trazodone is being substituted for benzodiazepines in the long-term care environment. And we wanted to um, assess the relative safety um, in relation to fall risk for new low-dose trazodone. Uh, so we found in the course of our work that low-dose trazodone was no safer against a risk of a fall-related injury than new use of benzodiazepines. Um, and, um, you know, in light of the increasing trends in use of uh, low-dose trazodone in the nursing home environment, we feel that um, this idea of substitution for antipsychotics and benzodiazepines perhaps needs to be pursued a little bit further. So if we look at the next slide, this is just illustrating um, the trends in use of benzodiazepines in Ontario nursing homes over time compared to an increasing uh, rate of use of uh, Other work by our team has illustrated there's a similar decreasing trend in antipsychotics, um, but there really is not a very good literature on the impact of trust um, in this low-dose application. And so this... Um, uh, graph illustrates incidence of an emergency department visit or an acute care admission for a fall-related um, injury. And you can see over time that the risk of falls is really no different in the matched group of benzodiazepine users and the matched group of low-dose azadone users. And uh, one of the, for those of you who are methodologists on the phone, 
um, the important thing in thinking about these comparative effectiveness studies is how we incorporate a frailty lens into this work. And so in this case, we actually matched, in, as part of our matching algorithm, we matched on uh, frailty status. So we matched those who were not frail, uh, who were new benzodiazepine users, with who were not frail as low dose trazodone users, and similarly uh, matched frail users. And when we did the subgroup analysis, the finding was exactly the same. So within uh, the frail population in the nursing home environment, as well as in the not frail population, uh, the risk of falls was between uh, new starts of the boat. Uh, so the next study is looking at the cholinesterase inhibitor discontinuing uh, following nursing home admission, and Colleen will describe this work. So this is uh, one of our later studies where we looked at a different medication class in relation to um, new admits to long-term care in Ontario. So we looked at all new admissions between 2011 and 2015. So this was approximately 48 um, thousand older adults with dementia, newly admitted, um, and their mean age was about 85. And we, we wanted to look at um, characteristics and distribution of cholinesterase inhibitor use at the time of admission. Also, what happened during the one-year follow-up, who maintained, who stopped, who started. Um, and then we built a multivariable model looking at factors predicting time to discontinuation with a focus not only on resident characteristics, but also on drug-related characteristics how long have they been using other drug use, et cetera, but also a prescriber uh, level factor. So this is where we're trying to look at those other contextual factors that might determine uh, use or discontinuation of a potentially risky medication in vulnerable populations beyond um, just looking at resident frailty or, or resident characteristics. Um, so briefly what we found at the time of admission, Approximately one third of residents were on a cholinesterase inhibitor, and among this group, less than 20% discontinued. And so this is showing that uh, if they're coming in on the cholinesterase inhibitor, they do tend to stay on it. And so our discontinuation estimate was quite a bit lower for this population compared to the literature. Our key predictors of discontinuation um, included um, some clinical um, contraindications, which makes sense. So if the resident had syncope, they were more likely to discontinue, which is, is aligning with good practice. Um, if they had more severe cognitive impairment, if they had higher frailty, they were also more likely to dis discontinue. Interestingly, we saw also um, that if they had severe behavioral symptoms, they were more likely to discontinue. Um, and if their primary prescriber was more active in the nursing home, they were more likely to discontinue. There were three variables that were associated with a reduced likelihood of stopping. That included being an older resident, which is somewhat discouraging given the clinical guidelines, um, being an unmarried resident, uh, which is interesting, and also a longer duration or, or historical duration of cholinesterase inhibitor use. They were, if the longer it was, the less likely they were to stop. So we, we found some interesting clinical um, alignment uh, with the guidelines, but also some novel findings and, and thinking about why older adults are staying on it when maybe they shouldn't, um, why unmarried residents um, were more likely um, to uh, stay on it, and the role of family perhaps in prescribing decisions and historical medication use. So this prescribing inertia and what might be related to that. So in terms of final thoughts from the quantitative comportion, um, we did show that frailty is important and, and sometimes does align with clinical guidelines like the cholinesterase inhibitor study, but sometimes is opposite. So with antipsychotics, we found that if they were more frail, they were more likely to be on antipsychotics. And we also found that for some other potentially inappropriate medications. Beyond frailty, we found that there are other resident level factors, but also other uh, system and prescriber factors that drive rates or uh, drive discontinuity continuation of potentially inappropriate medications. Um, and it's important to then understand the reasons underlying these associations which point to future research. Um, and sometimes our findings were aligned with what we would, we would expect and is consistent with guidelines and good practice, and sometimes they were not, depending on the drug class. So we'll move over to um, uh, Andrew and Leanne. Great. Thank, thanks, Susan and Colleen and uh, CFN for the opportunity to be part of today's presentation. 
as uh, both Colleen and Susan have alluded to, uh, we were also interested in uh, conducting a mixed methods approach using qualitative methods to really get a sense of the understanding of the context of which the prescribing patterns were happening in the long-term care uh, facilities that we, we involved in the, the mixed methods part. Excellent. So. Oh, okay, great. So we're just having a little bit of, of challenges. Um, so essentially what I'm going to talk to you about is a slice of the data from the qualitative because we actually did get a lot of rich data, um, but we, we undertook a qualitative design with direct content analysis. The sampling frame uh, included nursing homes and it was determined through an initial stratification from our, our colleague Susan and Colleen at ICES, relate, or ICES, um, related to uh, looking at bed size, frailty status, facility and facility polypharmacy. This was followed by individual recruitment emails sent to administrators of the long-term care facilities in Ontario to ask them to participate in the study. For those uh, long-term care administrators who agreed to participate, a uh, research coordinator had organized both a facility visit that consisted of interviewing patients, um, participants in terms of healthcare professionals, residents, caregivers, personal support workers, and administrators. And prior to the interviews being conducted, uh, we did inform, we did obtain a informed consent, uh, as well as the uh, research coordinators then conducted the interviews and then had them uh, translated into transcripts. Next slide. In terms of uh, the, um, the, t the total participants, so who, who we actually involved was, was quite a huge, as you can see, over 88 healthcare providers and 39 residents and caregivers from the eight nursing homes who participated. The majority of healthcare providers were either nursing, or whether they were registered nurses or registered practical nurses, followed by administrators, health disciplines, which included pharmacists and social workers, as well as personal support workers. And to a lesser extent, we were able to uh, you, uh, interview a few medical doctors. The majority of interviews were female with 78% and worked in the profession 15, uh, 16 years plus and mostly employed full time. In terms of the resident and caregiver cohort, 56% were females and 44% were males. The average range for the residents was 81 to 83, so it was an older group uh, for the caregivers. And the average age, uh, um, sorry, there was people not who didn't respond to the question. The predominant ethnicity of the residents and caregivers was Caucasian with varying levels of education. And the majority of the residents lived in the nursing homes for two to three years or beyond. So it gives you a sense in terms of who, who we actually um, interviewed. In terms of uh, the slice of data that want to, yeah, the next slide, please. Um, the slice of data that we pulled out, although we had looked at um, four different classifications of medication, the narrative tended to focus mostly on the antipsychotics versus the antimicrobials, colon, and, hyster hyster and the, the fourth one, which is escaping me right now. Um, essentially, what's that? Statin, statin, sorry. So like I said, more than 90% of the narrative was really focused on the antipsychotic. And so what we found, um, and it kind of echoes what Colleen mentioned earlier around, we found things that were best practice and then that weren't necessarily aligned with best practice. But there was a tension that arised. And um, I forgot to mention that the interviews and were and site visits were collected over just under a two-year period starting in late 2015, finished in September 2017. And this was at a time when there was a lot of focus on the antipsychotics in the media and when we when we first started doing the interviews and, and then a series of interventions through HQ and other um, areas around academic detailing as well as some of the other interventions. But interestingly enough, we did find though that there was this tension that emerged that between using antipsychotics as a last resort and, and other areas where it was really trying to reconcile prescribing inappropriately and using antipsychotics when clinically warranted. So I'll talk a bit more about the first theme. And within this theme, as you can see, there was four sort of key areas that sort of emerged. So the theme using antipsychotic as a last resort reflected how many participants preferred and attempted to implement non-pharmacological strategies prior to having antipsychotics prescribed for long-term care residents. Several participants used the phrase last resort, including a pharmacist who also emphasized the importance of having residents and families aware of efforts taken by long-term care staff to manage resident behaviors. As noted, certainly antipsychotic medications, we do, we do want the residents and families to be aware that we do we reserve those only as a last resort. In response to negative coverage in the media and a focus on re 
reducing around inappropriate prescribing and antipsychotics from HQO, long-term care facilities were working towards a culture shift around appropriate prescribing of antipsychotics. As one registered practical nurse noted, we don't promote medication use. We're one of the lowest ones in our LIN for medication use. This culture shift also involved educational efforts, predominantly targeted to long-term care staff, to increase their awareness and knowledge of non-pharmacological approaches to managing responsive behaviors. Specifically, healthcare providers and personal support workers describe how they've been trained to manage responsive behaviors through programs including gentle persuasion approaches, pieces, and Montessori. This additional training enabled them to use a variety of non-pharmacological strategies with residents, including getting to know residents and employing a redirect or keep busy approach. As one administrator noted, non-pharmacological interventions, we have to keep them busy with activities. We have to involve them. And there's sometimes a program in the staff who would visit. We also encourage the family members to come and visit them more often. Strategies included conducting a comprehensive assessment and behavior mapping, managing behaviors through this gentle precision approach and Montessori approaches, and accessing internal and external resources such as the uh, B B BPSO uh, resources. The other, uh, on the other flip side, uh, the theme around reconciling using antipsychotics inappropriately necessary emerged where healthcare providers describe inappropriate use of antipsychotics as underuse, referred to as the flip side or fear to use, overuse, and misuse, referred to by some as off-label. As one registered practical nurse mentioned, antipsychotics or chemical restraints, we underuse them for some people, we overuse them, misuse them trying to treat behaviors that are proven to have absolutely no effect with these medications. Some healthcare providers also shared concerns around the side effects of using antipsychotics inappropriately in that residents would just sleep and were at risk for falling. Further, several study participants identified being short-staffed and high workloads as a contributing factor to inappropriate use of antipsychotics as they did not have time to drill down why residents were acting up or aggressively behaving to, or to monitor vigilantly and de-escalate the resident. Despite efforts to reduce inappropriate use, there were still some participants who felt that using antipsychotics was necessary when clinically warranted, for example, a diagnosis of psychosis, and to manage aggressive behaviors in the short term. As one administrator noted, we are working on always having a diagnosis to go to with antipsychotics in order so that when we're not just using them willy-nilly because it's not always appropriate. A few of the physicians described when the long-term care staff approached them for a prescription for antipsychotics, they often have felt they had exhausted non-pharmaceutical approaches. And some healthcare providers described the resident requiring antipsychotics in order for them to receive care, for example, bathing. There were also some family members who preferred their loved ones to be on the antipsychotic describing the medication as keeping them calm and stable. So in terms of implication, what we learned from this particular slice of the data was the importance of continuing education for regulated and unregulated care staff around the, um, the medications, residents' conditions, and behavior management approaches, and also the need for initial discussion on admission and ongoing discussions, education, and engagement of residents when possible and family members, caregivers around their care plan, which includes the medication plan of care. Part of this education is having the family members recognize and share with the long-term care staff the side effects or changes in behavior and have their preferences around medication use taken into consideration when an urgent behavior issue arises. And during standard reviews, where it was the six weeks quarterly reviews and often the annual case conferences. Thank you. So it's Andrew and uh, I'm gonna take over from here uh, from Leanne. And uh, this part of the project I'm gonna be discussing is uh, the evaluation and prioritization of stewardship programs for nursing homes using a modified Delphi uh, panel approach. So I don't think I really uh, need to go further than to uh, affirm that uh, residents of long-term care facilities are a growing population with a high susceptibility to infection. Estimates range from uh, three to upwards of 15%, um, often difficult to really identify what is the accurate number because of um, overdiagnosis as well. And because of that overdiagnosis, we have a high use of antibiotics, which are one form of antimicrobials. And our current belief is that upwards of 
50% or more um, of antibiotic use in long-term care facilities may be inappropriate. That inappropriate use of antimicrobials has uh, several complications. Um, one of them is the direct ad adverse drug effects, and uh, those could be the ones that people are commonly familiar with, like um, gastrointestinal upset, rash, um, and um, other uh, biochemical disorders. But on top of that, the overuse of antibiotics in long-term care facilities can promote antibiotic resistance, which appears to be a growing problem in Canada as well as uh, C. difficile infection, which is a well-recognized problem, um, but only recently are we starting to appreciate the growth of uh, C. difficile as a um, problem in long-term care facilities as well. In response to all of these issues around antimicrobial use, um, efforts have been made to start antimicrobial stewardship programs. And these are institutional uh, programmatic initiatives and approaches that aim to optimize how we use antibiotics and at the same time um, make people feel better and not make them worse in any manner. Uh, unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, um, antimicrobial stewardship programs are rather uncommon in long-term care and uh, that's a, a, a status that is um, universal, um, not only in Canada, but elsewhere. So what we wanted to do is to utilize the modified Delphi method to evaluate interventions for implementing antimicrobial stewardship programs in nursing homes. We wanted to provide nursing homes uh, at the end of this process with two tools. One was a prioritized list of appropriate and necessary interventions uh, related to antimicrobial stewardship um, for nursing homes, and also to understand the resources required um, to implement interventions. So um, we used uh, this um, theoretical framework of the modified uh, Delphi method. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, the Delphi method is a um, well-established process of formalizing an approach to gaining consensus. Um, it was uh, co-developed by uh, folks at RAND, uh, corporation in California, along with the uh, UCLA, the University of California at Los Angeles. And the work always starts with a review of the literature. Um, then you uh, survey um, Delphi panel participants. Uh, you in the modified process, you then have a, a meeting and a second survey, and then that is followed up with uh, knowledge exchange uh, following uh, the results from your meeting and second survey. So uh, we started with trying to uh, recruit panelists. We identified uh, 36 potential panelists um, after uh, um, refining it and ensuring that we had appropriate um, balance and diversity, uh, geographic, gender, profession, et cetera. We invited 23 to participate and had uh, 16 uh, accept. As you can see here, we had a, a diverse um, panel composition and that included uh, residents and advocates for uh, of uh, long-term care facilities. And as you can see here, we uh, um, tried to encapsulate the uh, larger uh, circle of care around antimicrobial prescribing. We identified stewardship interventions from a literature review, and then we evaluated um, the interventions by the following uh, criteria. After our first survey, um, we actually obtained no consensus for inclusion um, using all of those uh, scientific criteria for any of the interventions. Um, several interventions um, did receive consensus for rejection. So these were interventions that everyone agreed should not be considered, and those were antibiotic cycling, uh, automatic uh, formulary substitution, 
So that's where you, a patient is prescribed one agent and automatically it's substituted to a different agent. Um, formulary review, so that this is related to um, any kind of institutional formulary, uh, it was, that was largely rejected because most long-term care, care facilities um, don't really adhere to a formulary other than provincial formulary plans were present. And then IV to oral transition, again, feeling that uh, the use of intravenous antibiotics is uncommon in long-term care. Um, after survey two, there was one intervention that received consensus for inclusion across all criteria, and that was uh, development of guidelines for empiric prescribing of antimicrobials. Um, there were further uh, interventions that uh, were additionally rejected, as you can see there. So we, um, to summarize what we did, we identified uh, 14 interventions. One uh, intervention that uh, wasn't in our uh, literature review initially, but came up during the face-to-face -face panel meeting was uh, communication tools to optimize antimicrobial use. You can see there that we uh, eliminated nine um, interventions in total. And so we ended up with a final list of six. Those six are listed here. Uh, guidelines for empiric antimicrobial prescribing, um, audit and feedback of prescribing practice, uh, communication tools for prescribing, short course antibiotic therapy, whereby you uh, endorse and support the use of shorter uh, durations of therapy than uh, usually are performed, uh, scheduled antibiotic reassessment, which uh, we previously had labeled based on the literature de-escalation, and uh, clinical decision support systems. And what you can see here, that mean uh, reflects the mean rank. Um, we asked panelists to rank each of these interventions uh, from one through six to help prioritize what should be done first. And you can see here that uh, guidelines for empiric prescribing were the uh, clear runaway hit um, with a mean of 1.3. And there really wasn't a large difference between the remaining five, although audit and feedback and communication tools uh, seem to be much more strongly supported than the clinical decision support systems. I think what you can also see is, uh, or um, you can see here, but uh, you can't recognize it if you weren't at the discussion, was that the availability of clinical decision support systems was the primary reason why it had a lower priority. So, um, you know, the modified Delphi uh, method has uh, numerous strengths, including a formal way to uh, arrive at uh, consensus. It codifies it. it the face-to-face -face discussion allows people to um, uh, explain reasons for the decision making. And as, as I mentioned, we had a pretty broadly representative panel. Unfortunately, it it's not a perfect um, method. It still is consensus, and so one could call it more evidence-informed than evidence-based. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, there may have been some influence from the moderator at the time. Um, people have challenged the modified Delphi method uh, at times, um, and uh, certainly we couldn't be as representative as we would have wanted, even though I've emphasized the representativeness. Uh, the, our main limitation was primarily because of cost and feasibility, having broad geographical representation with an overweighting to Ontario panelists. Uh, future directions for this kind of work would be looking more at the feasibility, trying to improve our evidence base, look at the policy implications, and also to consider no novel interventions for antimicrobial stewardship and long-term care. And so uh, just to summarize, uh, as see here, I'm just gonna emphasize the guidelines for empiric prescribing as the highest priority uh, that's needed in, uh, at least in long-term care in Canada right now. And um, the resources that we're suggesting that would be needed to more robustly implement stewardship would be having an electronic medical record, uh, getting more staffing and funding. And uh, as mentioned, I wanted to uh, 
acknowledge uh, CFN for all this work. Saul Kruger was the highly qualified uh, personnel who performed the legwork for much of, of this uh, last presentation. Uh, the panelists, and I list all the panelists here who uh, gave of their uh, time, often traveled um, to uh, inform us clearly. And I'm gonna stop there. Thanks, Andrew, and, and thank you all for your excellent presentation today. We'll now start the Q&A part of the webinar and hoping that the audience will continue to send in your questions and you'll use the panel on the side where it says submit questions or questions. Uh, Amanda, over to you. Great, so uh, just to start things off, I'll put a question out to um, all the speakers and you can just choose who's the most appropriate to answer it. Um, but given the association between frailty and potentially inappropriate medication use, uh, what are the implications for future research and clinical care interventions for the long-term care setting? Colleen, did you want to start with this one or do you want me to start? Oh, you can go ahead. I'll jump okay. in. So I think that um, at least across the spectrum of the quantitative studies that we've done, we've, we've illustrated an important rail for measuring and capturing frailty level. I think we showed that over and above accounting for other comorbidities that frailty role in um, not just whether people receive medications, but that what their outcomes of receiving those medications might be. I think the place where the waters become a little more muddy is how to interrelate all of the factors that go into a prescribing decision and how to trade off the system level factors against some of the individual um, resident needs. Um, Colleen, did you want to add anything else at that yeah. point? Yeah, I, I think some of the associations, of course, are worrisome because the most vulnerable are, are the most likely to get to get the potentially inappropriate medications or multiple um, potentially inappropriate medications. So that is that's, that is worrisome. And, and why that is happening is an important question to ask. Um, what might be contributing to that? Uh, how we can intervene against that? Um, where to start? Um, certainly, we show the role of not only prescriber, um, but also family. Uh, in long-term care um, and other care staff. So it's it's important to note um, that association and to, and to think about this care setting where we're often trying to strive for, for an approach that reflects less is more. Um, so there will always be situations where we don't have all the data to answer the question. We don't know the individualized decision-making that went around the continued use of a potentially inappropriate medication. And we do need to delve deeper into that. And, and should, should we have that information, we might find some cases are appropriate. But uh, on the descriptive level, it's worrisome that the most vulnerable tend to be at higher risk. And, and we've seen that before in other research as well. That is, and uh, we, is really a concern. Um, do you have any thoughts about, um, given that it's a very uh, complex uh, interaction, you know, or number of events that lead to uh, prescribing? Um, do you have any, uh, I guess, ideas about what the prescriber role, how it may be different in long-term care versus in acute care settings, and how that might play a role? I know this hasn't, you haven't looked at this point yet, but uh, do you have any ideas going forward where to look? I think I can start an answer to that one. So in some um, previous work, actually many years ago, um, now Jonathan Lamb, who was a master's student doing his thesis with us, looked at who was doing the prescribing in the long-term care environment and actually showed that um, you know, in the context of primary care providers, there's um, a, a, a smaller subset of all um, prescribers that people come into contact with who are responsible for the majority of prescriptions. Um, and again, I think we illustrated this in some of the work that um, Nick Daneman led as part of this grant. And so thinking um, a little bit around um, where the barriers are and what the, the factors are that are um, people feel that they need to reach for a potentially inappropriate medication. So I think some of what we've shown in our research which work on antibiotic um, medications through this grant is, is that some of it has to do with um, 
people's historical tendencies. They tend to prescribe how they've always prescribed. And, um, and that's, again, where thinking about interventions for de-prescribing uh, start to come in. I know Barb Farrell has been leading some really terrific work out of Ottawa in this regard. Um, but I think sometimes the decisions are focused in a, a smaller subset of all of those who could potentially prescribe. It's also true, Susan, that we've shown with some of the work that the prescriber involved is is often outside in the community. Um, and so what's happening before someone arrives at the door of long-term care is very important and, and uh, the continuation of the medications that they come in on. Um, we, we also showed with the cholinesterase uh, example that if you had a primary prescriber who was more engaged in long-term care, there was more uh, indication that appropriate medication use was, was uh, happening. So the engagement in long-term care, the involvement, the affiliation, um, also the, the role of pharmacists and other care providers and, and how that's operating in long-term care is clearly important. Yeah, I think actually Colleen raises a really good point there. One of the important findings that showed up in a couple of our studies, the idea of where the medication was started, so that often the medications that are being prescribed in the long-term care environment are not being started in the long-term care environment. They're merely being continued. And are the yeah. interventions uh, required to look at continuing, continuing a medication perhaps different than uh, the concept that medications are being newly started? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, we have some questions coming in now um, with one question asking uh, whether or not uh, the roles of different health professionals have been looked at. Um, I know that uh, with regards to the potentially uh, inappropriate medications and in particular were um, personal care workers or personal support workers uh, included in the either the qualitative um, interviews. Before, Leanne, you answer that, I can just um, make a quick comment. Um, when we first started our work in assisted living, what's interesting about assisted living is the very different staffing mix and, and, and staffing ratios, where you don't tend to see RNs on site, for example. Um, in one of our earlier studies, we found that the composition, not having an, a 24-hour 7 RN, um, did, did actually influence um, um, the likelihood of potentially inappropriate uh, antipsychotic use. So the, the staffing mix, training, understanding, education, uh, availability of uh, professional nursing and assisted living did make an important uh, contribution. Whether, whether this relates to what's happening in long-term care in Ontario and the complement of staff, and, and I, again, I, I stress the importance of pharmacy involvement. We haven't, I don't think we've delved enough into that, and, and Leanne, I'll let you speak to what you found. Yeah, um, th thanks, Colleen. And yeah, so we, we did, um, we had the, uh, the pleasure of having a wide variety of individuals that we were interviewing. Um, what, we, I, what I forgot to mention is that uh, in terms of the stratification, our, the qualitative team was blinded to the actual um, stratification. So we didn't know whether we were going into long-term care homes that we're, you know, we're, we're having, you know, acceptable, appropriate prescribing for the four classifications of meds. But one of the things that came out in terms of, so I'll sort of pick up on the personal support worker. So there were some nursing homes, long-term care facilities that also would make sure or engage the uh, the personal support workers in the behavioral modification. So the, the personal um, gentle persuasion uh, and also the uh, sort of the de-escalation techniques. And so they were actually being educated to because they are the ones that actually have the most face time with the residents. Um, as Colleen had mentioned, there was varying staffing in terms of RN, RPN, um, but the role of the pharmacist came out particularly on antipsychotics and then antimicrobial. So that was, like as I said, 90% was really around antipsychotics and then uh, probably about 8% was around um, antimicrobials. And so there were some interesting dynamics with the antimicrobials as well. And so that was things like um, obviously the uh, nursing staff sort of either picking up or, or making sure that they weren't, you know, ordering tests or that if they were asymptomatic. And so that we, we certainly did find some some differences in, in the roles in that with, with the different um, prescribing as well. Um, and then there was some, uh, there was also the physician group, I think they have an annual meeting that they talked about as well that was quite influential in terms of getting um, education. So education was really uh, critical, but not necessarily every home 
provided education to every healthcare provider. And then when I mentioned earlier too, there was also external resources that some of the organizations would tap into the behavioral program or BPO, I think it was, uh, that there was also some nurse practitioners that were coming in. And so each long-term care had a different sort of staff composition um, and different approaches to how they actually, but certainly the role of the pharmacist was critical, the role of the nurses, the role of the healthcare providers, less extent to the social worker probably because it's not something that's really medication and prescribing is not necessarily a part of. But I want to reiterate too, we also um, found and what was said, I think it was either Susan or Colleen, related to uh, them coming, so either going, getting admitted to emerge and coming back or reluctance to take them off medications that have been prescribed prior to coming into long-term care, both the providers as well as the caregivers when and when the patients were cognitively attacked also shared stories around not necessarily knowing what they're on. So in terms of um, getting back to the first question around what some of the qualitative uh, findings in terms of implications, certainly we felt that there's a definitely role for educating patients and care or residents and caregivers more around medications and sort of what to look for in that too was, was something that had emerged from the data set that was collected uh, over a year ago or finally what we finalized over a year ago. Great. Thank you. Um, and maybe a question now for um, Andrew. Um, we have a question here about uh, whether or not the Delphi panel results have been published, um, so they may also um, be sort of referred to by studies ongoing in other provinces or other places. Um, and then maybe comment on what you think uh, the value is of having the empiric guidelines. Sure. So just to be clear, generally, I don't answer any questions, but I'll make an exception uh, <laughs> one time. Um, so, uh, no, the the uh, Delphi panel uh, results haven't been published yet. The, it, it's just uh, the write-up is just being completed right now, so it hasn't even uh, been submitted. Um, the second part is ar around the uh, guidelines, the uh, value of those. Um, Antimicrobial stewardship, I'm going to say, in fact, prescribing in general, um, interventions to improve it require um, an approach of, of behavior change that, at a minimum, tells you what is appropriate. So when we uh, you talk about potentially inappropriate medications, we have a variety of different ways of uh, deciding, and those include the, the beers, uh, criteria or list for potentially inappropriate medications. Uh, for antibiotics, um, appropriate um, is defined in a bunch of different ways, but one of those includes um, having a standard of what is an appropriate choice, duration, dose, and route of administration of antimicrobials. And so the only way to uh, start improving how antimicrobials are prescribed are to in fact have a standard that's set ideally based on um, published clinical trials that demonstrate a benefit or a safety opportunity around uh, standards. Uh, the problem we have in Canada and uh, will continue to have in the, uh, in, at least in the near future is that we don't have governance around uh, um, prescribing guidelines, so there are no prescribing guidelines for most clinical indications. There are many local efforts all around the country, um, but what the primary problem is it leaves the prescriber rather confused, and they end up um, often choosing um, uh, prescriptions or, or treatments based on a variety of sources that could include members of the pharmaceutical industry, uh, advertisements and pamphlets received, just what their uh, nearest colleague might do, um, rather than um, reliable um, guidelines um, that have a, a standard applied to them for their development. Yeah, those are, yeah, that's very good, thanks. And uh, maybe just one final comment or question for the group. Um, our residents in long-term care um, are community dwelling older adults um, until they are admitted to long-term care. Are there any thoughts uh, from the group about how to decrease this potentially um, inappropriate medications among community dwelling frail seniors? 
Uh, it's Andrew, I'll start. And I, I know uh, other members have uh, uh, thoughts as well. Um, you're right, it, it is a continuum. It's not just a problem in long-term care. And uh, I think our, our first step and what we've done as well as others have been to identify the problems and then start understanding solutions. But behavior change um, first requires understanding the sources of those behavior and then uh, tackling them. And it isn't always an education problem. Education is helpful, but we need to put um, mechanisms in place that make it easy for everyone to be doing the right thing and making for sure that there's good transfer of information amongst all the uh, stakeholders involved. Good answer. Yeah. Okay, I know we're running out of time and I was going to ask for some final thoughts, but I think we're at the end of the webinar. So I'm going to thank you very much, all of you, for sharing your insights and your research today. Um, and Andrew, thank you for answering two questions today. And thanks to everyone who's come on today. And I hope you can all join us on our next webinar on Wednesday, November 21st. Um, if you have further questions, the emails are on the uh, screen right now, and they would welcome, I'm hoping, uh, some uh, of your questions that didn't get answered. I think we've answered most of them. Um, so please have a great rest of the day, and that ends today's webinar. Thank you very much.